is Felisa, and um, I wanted to come and do the story like time. I actually, um, this is the first time that I've really been out of the bed, haven't really felt well. I'm just now getting um, getting my bearings and you know getting back to feeling like my old self. Thankfully, it's been a rough go of it. So there's that. But I've really the last couple of days been thinking about my granddad and. Actually, I think about my grandmother, my grandfather, and now my dad around this time of the year because, you know, they've passed on and, you know, I miss them tremendously. But I happen to be thinking about my granddaddy um, the last couple of days for whatever reason, and I always, you know, have conversations with them. I know y'all think that that's weird, but I do. Anyway, so as I was thinking about him, I was thinking about um, an encounter that I had not too long after he passed away. And I wanted to do this story time because I think that it hopefully will help someone that is, that's someone that has experienced grief and loss who may be in the process of grieving um, to ask you to just leave yourself open to encounters or messages or just certain signs that will bring you peace. I'm struggling to, to to actually convey that because, you know, certain words, I try and avoid using them because um, particularly for my, you know, for my Christian community, which, you know, I identify with, we can be so negative when it comes to certain schools of thought or being open and receptive to certain things because we think everything is a demon. <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny, but we do. Anyway, so moving on from that, um, I wanted to come and do this story time just as an encouragement for y'all that might be grieving. So <clears throat> my grandfather and I were extremely close. Like this man was everything to me. I'm gonna have to try not to cry. It's been 30 some odd years, but I promise you. Anyway, so we were very close and um, he stepped in as like, uh, not as like he was my father. My father and my mother divorced when I was six years old. If you've seen my vlog on daddy abandonment and rejection issues, I think that that was the name of it. Something along those lines. Then you know my story and you know, you know, how my father leaving deeply affected me. But, you know, my grandfather, who was in his 70s when I was born, stepped into that role and did the absolute best he could by being a daddy for me. So anyway, I grew up like the sun rose and set on my grandfather. Like there was no wrong that he could have ever done in my eyes. And I'll try and post a picture um, of us. Uh, my grandfather actually played Santa Claus at one of the local department stores here in my city. And I would go visit him every year. Never had a clue that that's who it was. Um, but he would take extra time for with me and, you know, kind of listen to my 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 list and tip my mother off as to what I wanted. Anyway, um, so yeah, he um, he was like it, the end all be all for me. So when he got sick, he got sick. I noticed that he was sick Thanksgiving of 1985. We were all at dinner and my grandfather had a habit of like he would wolf down his food. Like he literally would hover over his food and wolf it down. We would be on first and my grandfather would be like on seconds and thirds. He learned how to eat that way, according to legend, because he grew up as one of nine boys on a plantation in Quitman County, uh, Tennessee, Jones, Jonestown, um, Mississippi, excuse me, not Tennessee. I don't know where that came from. Jonestown, Mississippi. Quitman County, um, there was a huge plantation. And, you know, like many of our ancestors, he was born into a sharecropping family. And uh, so all the boys were, um, like they were, like they had to go work in the field and, and uh, um, farm and pick cotton or whatever they else they grew on that plantation anyway. So with nine boys or having eight siblings that were all boys, the, yeah, if you didn't hurry up and, number one, get your food and eat it, then your brother will probably sit it off your plate. 
So that tendency stayed with him all of his life. He just literally, I don't even know if the man tasted his food, but <laughs> that's not here nor there. Anyway, this particular Thanksgiving, I, um, my grandmother always hosted. And so, you know, there was family around, um, the table. Not many of us, because my family was very small, but you know, everybody was engaged in conversation and I happened to look at my grandfather. My grandfather, first of all, he hadn't finished his meal, which was a huge red, red flag for me. And um, his, his, his breathing was so labored. Like he was literally gasping for air. He wasn't speaking, which wasn't unusual. My grandfather was a man of very few words, but his breathing was so labored. And I remember looking at him and knowing immediately that he was dying. So in typical, you know, Felisa fashion, I jump up from the table because I, I always have had a flair for the dramatic. <clears throat> um, so I go upstairs and I am in absolute tears. I'm hysterical. So my mother comes upstairs. She's like, what the heck is wrong with you? And I said, no, granddaddy is sick. Like he is sick. Nobody is paying attention to him. He is sick. And I'm looking at her. She's looking at me. She's like, he's fine. I was like, no, he's not, mom. He's so, he's sick. Nobody is, nobody's paying attention. So I'm trying to tell her that this man is critically ill. Of course, nobody takes children seriously. So anyway, a couple of weeks after that, um, sure as crap, he went to the hospital he was super sick. He wasn't able to catch his breath. Um, and so they take him to the hospital. This had to be like December now. So we're there, like right around Christmas. Um, so take him to the hospital. He was admitted. And, um, you know, they basically said that, you know, he, he needed to go in for exploratory surgery. They didn't know exactly what was wrong. This is the 80s. So they're still like figuring stuff out. Anyway, so they cut him open and just stitched him back up and said that, you know, there was really nothing that they could do. He not only had prostate cancer, which um, had spread, he was now experiencing um, congestive heart failure because of that and having some pulmonary issues. So all of this connectivity of illness plus his advanced age, which at that time was 85 was just not um, conducive to his well-being. So they literally sent him home to die. So um, I, you know, I they sent him home and I just thought, oh my gosh, nobody told me that they sent him home to die. He just came home in my head. I didn't find out that they sent him home to die and what had happened until much later in life. Um, but he came home. I was excited to see him. He was very weak. He lost a lot of weight. And, um, but he was still very much my hero. And eventually though, his care and his, um, his needs, his medical needs, my grandmother was 86 at the time, were just, it was just too much for her. And so they made the decision, she and my mother made the decision to place him in a nursing home. This was like January, I want to say, by this time, you know, they decided that he just needed more complex care than they were able to give to him at home. So they placed him in this nursing home. I remember going to see him once. And uh, this was in January. And he was still laboring for breath. He still wasn't, you know, doing very well. And I just could not, like, I couldn't take it. I really could not take it. So I left there saying, I'm just going to go see him when he comes home. I'm never going back to that place. I'm just going to go see him when he comes home. Well, one morning I woke up. It was time for me to go to school. I just really didn't feel good. Like, I was sick to my stomach. I was just headachy. And did, I really didn't know what was wrong with me. So I told my mother I, I really didn't want to go to school that day. She let me stay home. And I remember about 1 o'clock or so, I all of a sudden felt better. So around that time, my mother called. And she, you know, she called to see how I was. You know, so she's making small talk. And she said, well... I just wanted to call and let you know that your grand your grandfather passed away. And I just remember sitting on the floor and just 
yelling, just hollering. Like I, nobody was at home except for the cat, just screaming. Fast forward, you know, that was a lot of detail, but um, I really didn't cope well with that. I felt a lot of guilt because I didn't go see him and I thought, you know, he was coming home and he never came home and I felt like, you know, I abandoned him. So I was experiencing a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of regret. And so, you know, I lost a ton of weight and refused to eat and literally was just like grieving myself. Just gr I spent every day crying, every day just begging him for forgiveness. Like, Granny, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Anyway, so um, let me get myself together. <laughs> sorry, y'all. Anyway, so one night... Um, I had this dream and in this dream, it was a house that was like, like just a huge house and it was all full of lights and, um, like every light in the house was on. And I remember thinking, somebody mama going to get mad because all these lights are on in the house. Anyway, it was a, it was a lot of music playing. There were people in the house. I never saw them, but I could hear them like talking and, you know, having fun and dancing. And I heard like glasses clinking like it was a party and I was off to myself sitting on this window seat and looking outside and outside was pitch black like I couldn't even it was dark dark like no street lights no nothing like just pitch black but I was sitting at the window and I was just staring outside into this dark and I all of a sudden I see this car approach. I couldn't really see the car, but I could see like the headlights. And so the headlights are approaching and I'm looking at this car, you know, kind of drive towards the house. And when the car got there, I, for some reason, the car was illuminated and I could see that it was the car that my grandfather drove while he was alive. And I could see my grandfather in the back seat, of, I mean, not in the back seat, in the driver's seat of this car. So I run out this house flying, get in the car. I'm like, oh my God, granddaddy, I'm so happy to see you. I love you so much. Blah, blah, blah. So I'm just talking. He never <laughs> said a word, true to life. Um, So he never said a word. I'm just babbling. He drives off and I'm just talking. How much I missed you. I'm so glad to see you. Everybody thought you were gone. I knew you weren't gone. Like whatever. And in the back seat of this car was one of his good friends that he was always together within life. His name was Mr. Fowler. If any of his relatives see this, yes. <laughs> so his name was Mr. Fowler. He was in the back seat, And like they, the, so for them to be together in this car, it like it didn't feel weird. Like they were supposed to be together. So, you know, Mr. Fowler's in the back seat. You know, I remember getting in and saying, um, you know, hey, Mr. Fowler. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm talking his face off, talking granddaddy's face off. And I don't know how long we drove, but I talked long enough until I looked and I realized that he had pulled back up in front of this house. Now I'm looking at this house. The house is all bright and illuminated. People still in there partying and didn't even know I was gone. People still in there, you know, doing what they do. And, you know, my grandfather like reaches across me and opens up my door. So, you know, this was like his, his signal, like, you got to go. And so I'm looking and I'm looking at him. I was like, granddaddy, I don't want to go. I don't want to go back in there. I want to stay with you. And my grandfather looked at me and said, it's not your time. And I said, but granddaddy, I want to go. Like, so now I'm just really hysterical. I'm like crying, crying, crying. And he looked at me and he said, let the dead rest. And baby, when I tell you I woke up, like, it was it was out of worldly. And I know that that was a message for my grandfather because number one, what I've learned over the years is a couple of things. Number one, that house represented life. It represented life and all of its various stages of interaction and engagement and light and illumination and just, just interacting, just living because it was a party and people were happy and people were engaged and they were intermingling with each other. The dark represented death. 
And because there was nothing in it, like there was nothing in it. There was, it was a void of nothing. It was just, just a black space. My grandfather's message to me, number one was twofold. Number one, he told me it was not my time. So stop it. What I was doing was grieving myself to death and grieving him in the process because he wasn't able to rest. He didn't make him feel good that I was up here giving so much energy in a negative kind of way because of him passing on and not really understanding that him passing on didn't make him less tangible to me. Didn't mean that I couldn't engage with him or tell him hi or tell him I missed him. It didn't mean that at all. It just meant that it was moving to a different type of engagement. And so once I understood that and once I understood that he was literally sending me back to life, sending me back to where I needed to be for this period of time that I'm here on earth and that that was his message to me, it became much harder to grieve him in a negative way. Now that, like I said, and I'm struggling, like I said, it doesn't mean that I don't miss him and it doesn't mean that I'm less affected by him not being here. It means that I was able to say goodbye and understand that his time was up. Oh, I hate myself for crying. His time was up and that he still loved me. And to 15-year-old me or 16-year-old me, that was so important. That validation was so important and it still remains important for me now because he still means everything to me. So for those of you all who have lost, lost loved ones and, you know, wonder, I really encourage you. Like, there is nothing wrong with telling them hello. Nothing wrong with saying, I miss you. Nothing wrong with saying, you know, that there is still a piece of your life that is empty and missing. But I know my grandfather is in a better place. I know that... It was his time and I know that his body wasn't serving him and that I was being completely selfish. Acknowledging I was being completely selfish. But, you know, I know that sometimes loved ones leaving us, especially if it's up abruptly, is so incredibly painful and so difficult to deal with. So I wanted to do the story time because, you know, of course I know what grief is and of course I know what loss is, but it's so imperative that you stay in your in your path on your path. It's so important that you stay in the life that you've been given and finish your purpose as God has given it to you because otherwise you abort purpose and you abort passion and you abort destiny that way. And you're not doing your ancestors any favors by continuing to grieve their loss as if they're gone forever and gone out of your life forever. All they did was just simply move from a physical to a spiritual realm. And those are the things that we have to understand. And those are things that we just have to accept. And we have to begin the work of healing and the work of freeing ourselves from unnecessarily wondering. Because they're still there. They really are still there. So I'm forever grateful for the message that my grandfather sent to me. My grandmother sent me one too. <laughs> I'll just share that in another story time. But she did. And so I hold on to those. I've written extensively about those in my journals just to keep those near. Um, and ever so often I'll whisper, I love you, granddaddy. Because I know he hears me. I'm Felisa. Leave your comments below. I hope this video has been helpful for you. I'm sorry for the cry. <laughs> But I think that, you know, tears are healthy and tears are, are cleansing. Um, and please don't misunderstand my, my tears for profound sadness. I'm sad for me because he was an awesome human being. And if I could have had him forever, I would have. But that's not the way that life works. And I accept that. But that doesn't mean that I don't miss him. Love y'all. Talk to y'all later. Bye.